Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to the Professional Satisfaction and Practice Sustainability webinar series. Before we begin, we wanted to quickly review some housekeeping items. This session will be recorded and will be available after the event. If you have questions, please place them in the Q&A box. We will have time at the end of the webinar to review many, if not all, of your questions. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Today's speaker is Dr. Joe Shapiro, who is an associate professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Harvard Medical School. Today, Dr. Shapiro will be presenting on how to implement a peer support program during a crisis. Welcome, Dr. Shapiro. Again, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to you. Wonderful. So I just wanted to thank all of you uh, for the work that you've been doing. It's really amazing. Um, and also for taking time out to be with, um, with me and, um, and with this community again today to think about something that I think is absolutely so important. And, and I know you do as well. Um, these are my disclosures. So I just want to start with a quote by Parker Palmer, who's an activist and educator, and he talks about institutions being where the human heart either gets welcomed or thwarted or broken. And I can just say in my training um, and beyond, I just, I don't think I was aware of the impact that our organizations have um, uh, on us, both of us in, as individuals for our well being and also the outcomes of the work that we do that we care about. And um, so I've been for, for years now interested in organizational um, change and organizational culture work. Um, and this, this work is, it, it comes from that wanting to <clears throat> help our organizations be places that welcome the human heart. So I want to talk about the culture of medicine in general, um, which I found remarkably consistent. I've had the pleasure of working outside of our country and in many different places in our country with all different kinds of healthcare organizations around the well-being work and culture change. And I think there are just some unbelievable, I mean, I'm very respectful of uh, cultural differences. And yet I found that the culture of medicine as a profession is remarkably similar every place I've been. So, you know, on the, on the bright side, I mean, we have just, it's a beautiful culture in many ways. And, you know, the, the biggest one is that we're healers and nobody will take that away from us. I, um, I think though, for us to get better um, and do better and evolve and innovate and, and support, we have to think of, of what's stopping us from doing that. And what, what are, what is the dark side of our culture? And the way I've, I've looked at this, it's um, this for many years, our system has treated us as an inexhaustible resource, ignoring our physical, mental, and emotional health. And we've internalized this. And I, I can't underestimate the um, power of that internalization of these norms and expectations um, that have been gradually increasing and increasing um, again to the point that, you know, ignoring, ignoring our, our, our very health. Um, so the challenges for improving our health, um, and especially our, our emotional health, is um, that, I mean, there's lots of, I don't know, and any organization doesn't have any program for that, is that existing programs tend not to reach physicians, um, and we'll talk a bit about why. Uh, so just to say, we have it, we do it, don't worry, it's all set, um, it really, I think you lose a lot of um, perspective on are the people who really may be needing it, or some of the people, just not getting the resources that you have? Um, and then there's the cultural and structural barriers um, to our asking for help. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we're reluctant, uh, fear of punishment, uh, stigma, all sorts of things. And this, um, of course, if you have a program set up and it doesn't get access because, um, because we don't want to, you know, we feel afraid of accessing it. That's just not, not helpful. And of course, you know, any, I mean, you're all lead, healthcare leaders. Um, you you got to think of like, well, what are your priorities? Um, and I do think that, you know, to the last point, need a burning platform that um, I think the burning platform is there for doing this work and for taking resources to, to support it. Um, and I'll, I'll make that case. 
So um, these are the, the kind of the five steps, but essentially um, they're the building blocks, I think really of how to, how to make a, a program. So the first one is leadership and what about leadership? Well, uh, the first, what I'd like to do start off is I think leaders have to um, really be invested in this. So you have to make the case because as leaders, yeah, you all have priorities um, and you know, everything sounds important. And so why is this really especially important? So, and then um, then what's the obligation or uh, how can leaders resource programs that, that really do matter? So here's my making the case part um, to start with this is the first step. So um, acute events like medical errors, um, we have, you know, to deal with this, medical errors, patient complaints, litigation. And then you put you know, that on top of some of the underlying chronic stressors. Now we've got COVID, but things like racism, harassment, disruptive behaviors, workload, a lack of autonomy, increased regulations. These are chronic stressors for, for our healthcare providers. And this has put a huge burden on us, just huge and ever increasing. And so, you know, rhetorically, I'd ask, how can we sustain our joy in work, as, as IHI calls this, uh, um, efforts to well-being to sustain our joy in work if we don't address these challenges? And, I, you know, it's rhetorical for, for a good reason. So um, I want to be able to sit what, what um, to sort of place where peer support fits in, because it isn't the well-being effort. It is a well-being effort. You all know, because you're doing a whole ton of things, I, I, I know. Um, to support well-being um, and peer support is is is, is an effort. But how do we think of, of these different efforts? Because uh, these different initiatives, because they're going to need to be multifactorial. So you know we've got the ones that that are the, the resilience-based ones, and those were I think really I'm going to say overemphasized when we first were talking about well-being. Um, and that was, you need to, um, you know, you need to practice yoga, you need to um, eat well and get lots of sleep and uh, train for a marathon. And I mean, all these things are, you know, wonderful. I'm not against personal resilience. I do some of those things. Um, but there, it's, it, you know, at some point, it's really unfair to ask people to deep breathe through a dysfunctional or toxic system. And so I think um, most of us in the well-being world, and I'm sure you as well have said, yes, that's great. And, 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 and what about some other things? And the, the other problem with the resilience, um, and this is still a problem, is, you know, being told to do all these things for ourselves, but not actually be given any time or space or, you know, kind of room, if you will, to do them, I think really breeds cynicism. So we just have to be a bit careful about that. Um, and the other the Venn diagram circle is, is relational. I mean, we're so social, right, um, uh, as humans. Um, and, and our colleagues and our community matter to us really, really deeply. And so um, you, you, we really want to think about what are we doing to um, create uh, a sense of community and, and, and collegiality. Because I think all of you would agree that, and, you know, I've been, I practice uh, surgery for my gosh, you know, close to 40 years. And I mean, I think medicine got much more isolating to practice um, over time, just, and we're not going to turn back that clock, but what can we do to, to have us feel connected? Because that's a huge source of well-being. And then there are the organizational systems um, and resource issues that um, are really, really important and um, specific, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with those uh, in, in just a bit. So I'm going to use, um, an acute stressor uh, that is an, being involved in a medical error as, as an example, um, not because it's the most frequent thing that happens to any of us, thank goodness, you know, it's, but it will happen to everybody in somewhere in our careers as part of a healthcare team, right? It just will. Um, if, we're, if we're taking care of patients, um, we're, we're in the clinical world, something will go wrong at some point. And, um, and it, I'm going to use it as an example for two reasons. One is it's really, really intense, and the, uh, and there's a lot of data about what the um, emotional fallout is on healthcare providers after errors. Um, and the other is that 
if you can um, build a system where you can support for the most intense, difficult thing to support for, which I think errors are, then the same principles are for whatever the triggers are, whatever the uh, reasons you know for which you are going to offer peer support. Um, so that said, well, let's let's just delve into this um, again to use as an example, if you will. So you know these are some of the effects of of, of errors on clinicians. Sadness, of course, and then there's shame. Shame is this feeling of beyond, like, I feel terrible about this and, you know, it shouldn't have happened. I feel really bad about it to um, going further than that saying it happened because I'm not a good enough nurse, a good enough physician, pharmacist, etc. And it really can lead to this feeling of self-doubt. And it's very, very intensely negative emotion. Um, and, you know, that's, um, uh, very prevalent. Um, and I, uh, I love the study. It was done years ago by Helmreich. And he looked at the similarities uh, between aviation and medicine. And he said, both stress the need for perfection and a deep perception of personal invulnerability. So we really are taught and again, internalize the idea that we're supposed to be perfect. And of course, we now know, which we really didn't understand because we didn't have safety science before. It's just impossible. I mean, we're sort of taught that to get great care for our patients, we have to be error-free all the time, perfect performance. And we can't be because we're human and we're wired to make errors. We still are obligated to prevent those errors from reaching the patient, but we'll never be by eliminating human error. I just don't think, you know, from my experience um, uh, doing peer support and, and being a clinician, I don't think that that's gotten internalized yet. Um, so we have this, you know, sense of shame and then fear, you know, fear is, is very prevalent. What, what are we afraid of? Well, we're afraid of what's going to happen to the patient. Uh, will the patient or family maintain their trust in me? Um, what will my colleagues think? We have a lot of reasons to be afraid of our reputation. Uh, first of all, we care, uh, which is a good thing. And um, it, it does tend to get harmed after um, adverse events. And, um, and then some other um, stressors around that, So, um, which I'll, I'll talk about. So I think, you know, um, it's very frustrating to um, be told that we are now in a shame and blame free uh, culture that we have, we've com converted to uh, a just culture, a safety culture, that's what we do, um, which would be personal accountability and systems accountability, not either or. Um, and it's it's a learning and growth mindset. That's what that's what we're supposed to be doing. And yet our system and our in, in the way we react to, to uh, adverse events tends to still be in that shame and blame culture. And it's a very hurtful kind of culture, not to mention antithetical to actually improving the system. So this is an example of, I would call it a uh, um, reputational uh, punishment, a uh, repercussion for uh, adverse events. So here's a, um, uh, a study which was actually just looking at, I think, unconscious bias, but it, it showed that uh, following a patient death that uh, women surgeons that referrals, their colleagues referring patients to them dropped by 54%. 54%. Well, it really had very, you know, just minimal effect on referrals for male surgeons. And I know this is used for unconscious bias, to, you know, as, as, as an example of it, but I, I actually put it as like, this just shows that we, we can be afraid rationally and we will be afraid of reputational harm. This happens to be more towards um, women surgeons in particular, but, you know, nobody is free from judgment uh, of our colleagues. And so, you know, that's a, a and that's a terribly wounding uh, place to, to, to be um, after, you know, an acute event. And then we've got all these other systems, which some of them can be done in a, in a just culture, a safety culture kind of way, but oftentimes they're not. So the internal systems like m and or root cause analysis, collaborative case review, uh, Department of Public Health, Board of Registration, uh, other countries have the Inspectorate, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, um, and then court of law, um, media. Um, some of these, like the court of law, right? Litigation is not a safety culture uh, a mechanism, really. It's, it's totally rooted in shame and blame, punishment of individuals over something that's happened. So that's what we're, you know, the culture that we're still in. And so all of this, you know, we can be very angry and frustrated about that. All of this leads to the sense of isolation, right? Um, and we're, you know, humans, humans are really, really, really social and being isolated, feeling isolated causes acute and chronic stress. So I want to talk um, pivot a bit, a bit towards COVID because um, 
uh, you know, this, this term of a crisis, I think we were thinking together that this is what we're talking about is, is, a, is a, a huge crisis. Um, of course, the acute event that I just mentioned to you, like errors are, are a crisis too, but, uh, le but let's think of more, you know, more broadly the current crisis we're in. And again, even though I'm gonna talk about COVID, you know, that's not, I mean, we're talking about any kind of a crisis that's causing uh, emotional um, and, uh, and many other kinds of stress for healthcare providers. So I'm going to um, talk to you about, these are some of the uh, emotions that I've seen uh, that uh, in providing a lot of peer support um, since the pandemic started. And, um, you know, this isn't necessarily, I mean, it's just my perspective on it. So trying to categorize and uh, explore some of the emotions that, that our, our colleagues are feeling. And the first one is grief. You know, we really have a sense of grief over um, so many losses and there've been so many losses. Um, we've got um, just the grief of patient deaths, you know, uh, keeping fam having to keep families away from their dying loved ones. Um, you know, just the loss of so much has happened happened um, in the way we, we are able to take care of patients and the way we're able to connect or not as a community. Um, lots and lots of loss. And then I think there's guilt. Um, I've heard this a lot. So um, I think the guilt comes from the unreasonable expectations that um, we have been that have been put on our shoulders and that we have internalized. Uh, so, you know, that's part of medicine is as I said earlier, um, there's a lot of expected of us, sometimes unreasonable in terms of, you know, our work hours and, 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 and our, you know, our kind of um, exposure to hazards and things like that. Um, and, you know, just the, how we're expected to even handle that so that if we're upset by something or, or, or affected by it, um, there's no room for that because we're supposed to not be affected by it. We're just supposed to keep moving forward. And then there's, you know, fear and anxiety. I'll just back on the guilt. I want to say that a lot of providers that I've spoken to, um, if they're not on the front lines taking care of patients, they feel guilty. Like even if they're doing, you know, t tons of amazing work, and they are, right? They, they're not doing frontline work, so it doesn't count, or they feel like they're letting their colleagues down. Fear and anxiety, clearly a big one. I mean, the hallmark of... Um, I think of COVID has been uncertainty and that really breeds fear and anxiety. You know, well, to start with, we're afraid of, of, are we going to get our loved ones sick? I mean, really, this is the first time I can recall my career, um, just, you know, healthcare providers having to worry that they're going to harm their families by the work that they do. I mean, that's huge fear. Um, there's a lot of anxiety about, um, you know, just, uh, I think practices are, you know, are struggling financially um, and, you know, how's that going to work? And, 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 you know, uh, what about our learners? You know, their whole um, medical students experience has been completely upended. So lots of fear and anxiety and, you know, it, the question of, you know, when is this going to end? And, you know, actually we're finding out, of course, it's not ending anytime soon. And, um, and we want to think about not just this crisis, but anyone that comes. And I think anger has been really a, a, a unfortunately well-earned emotion. And, and just a couple things to touch on. I think lack of uh, PPE, um, lack of transparency and, and cohesion from you know, our government around um, how, to, how to deal with this and support for you as leaders to, to, to do the right thing. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of us are, I'm sure you all are too, is, you know, really f are so upset about um, the healthcare disparities, like how this has so intensely um, unmasked that which we knew and cared about beforehand, before COVID, has now really, really just been unmasked and worsened uh, with vulnerable populations bearing a significant brunt of this, uh, uh, um, you just, the, the death uh, from from COVID, um, and then you know I I, also, I wanted to to include gratitude because what one of us has not had some gratitude um, we really have I mean there's so many things to be grateful for um, 
whether it's, you know, our, our families are safe or, um, you know, all the patients that whose lives have been saved um, and, um, and, and that how much our colleagues have stepped up. And I know you as leaders have both engineered things to make this happen and also, you know, been part of them, which is, you know, just how much we were able to pivot as a profession um, to do things that we were never, you know, we didn't think we could do and now we can do them. And I think we're grateful for that. And, um, you know, personally, I want to say that I got COVID um, at the beginning of March, probably traveling to do peer support training, um, where I traveled through New York. And um, I, 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 I didn't have to go to the hospital, but it was close. Um, I, I wake up every morning grateful that I didn't die, honestly. So, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there is a lot to be grateful for. And one thing that I found seen in doing peer support is um, clinicians tend to feel um, uncomfortable allowing themselves to feel two different kinds of emotions at the same time. And, you know, my, my answer to that is it's okay to hold both grief and gratitude. I mean, it is because one does not cancel the other out. They're both really, really present, I think. So um, these, everything I've talked about, are these are uh, what the first responders call normal reactions to abnormal events, right? It's the events that we're dealing with that are abnormal um, and um, events and circumstances. And, and you know what? Lots of times we, we, we can march forward and we're okay, for sure. You know, that does happen. Time does help and we get used to things or what have you. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes recovery is thwarted and this causes great harm to clinicians and our patients. And again, I wanted to just use as an example, um, the fallout or the, the, the potential uh, um, negative outcomes for clinicians after errors because we have so much data about that. Of course, the data is just coming out more and more about that uh, fallout from COVID on healthcare providers, you know, uh, um, including uh, suicide. So, um, but let's look at what, you know, the thing that we, we, we know is we have a, a lot of uh, data and I'm going to only just put one or two slides up about this, but this, uh, there are studies that basically show that burnout and depression are independent predictors of having uh, made a recent major medical error. So, you know, we're deeply affected by, by this as we should be, you know, we should be affected, um, but can we, can we, be affected and then not go on to having burnout, for example. That is, that's what we're going for, um, or depression. So we know that if you've made a medical error, you have a higher chance of becoming burnt out. If you become burnt out, you have a higher chance of ma making a medical error, a, a cycle we need to stop. And we know very disturbing, disturbingly, if you've made a medical error, you have, your suicidal ideation chance increases. And that's terrible. I mean, just think about that. Uh, nobody's suggesting that there is a one factor that's a risk for suicide for uh, uh, healthcare providers, but it is a factor, no question about it. There, and there are many factors. The point is, let's do something about this. So we, we looked to, to study this um, and we were looking at what, what could facilitate resilience um, in response to, um, to emotional workplace, emotional stressors, occupational hazards. Uh, and so um, I'll just tell you uh, two of the findings, uh, but what, one was um, when we asked a specific question, we asked about lots of different emotional uh, workplace stressors. One was um, if you were involved in an acute event, like an error, uh, adverse event, where, where would you want to get support from? And 88%, and this was, happened to be a physician survey, wanted to talk to a physician colleague, even though we have really you know, highly trained and wonderful um, uh, uh, mental health professionals, behavioral health, employee assistance program, just great people, but the vast majority wanted to talk to a colleague. Um, another study looked at, um, this also happened to be physicians, um, although like I said, the, the reactions and issues are not uh, peculiar to uh, physicians. Um, wh what were the factors that were associated with resilience after errors? And this specifically um, looked at um, uh, defining resilience as growth after uh, trauma. Um, and one of them clearly was talking about it with colleagues. So, you know, you need to build a program based on what we know to be true and what we know to be wanted. So what, what is peer support? Um, it basically, it's giving your loving presence to your colleague in a way that we just don't usually, not because we don't care, but we just don't have the structure or even the culture that actually has us in a position to do this. 
So it's you're giving your presence um, in a psychologically safe way. And that is big because psychological safety, if it's not provided, people won't be, they will not, they will not express their vulnerability. They, I mean, it's not safe psychologically. Um, and so that's really an important part of uh, creating a peer support program and doing a peer support intervention. Using, of course, empathic listening with validation and some other things beyond just listening, which help the peer essentially figure out what will help them recover grow and recover. Um, so non using as the peer supporter, non-judgmental curiosity, problem solving guidance. It's not, I'm gonna fix this for you. It's let's think together. Um, tell me what, you know, who you've spoken to, what do you think would be helpful, those sorts of things. And then connecting um, should they want to, but offering to connect the peer with further resources if, if they'd like. So where does this sit on the spectrum of, of support? Because there's many, um, many kinds of support. And I, I put it here in the middle between informal peer support is where we kind of check on each other. Hey, how you doing? Which is great. You know, I'm, I'm all in favor for sure. Um, the problem is I would call it necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and also it's not really an opportunity. No one is expecting if you ask them you know, just in passing, how are you, for you to sit with them for 45 minutes or to hear their vulnerability, how that, you know, look, hey, I'm falling apart here. I can't do this COVID work. It's too upsetting. Or I'm deathly afraid that I'm going to harm my family. I mean, it's not necessarily going to come up. It won't really in a, in a casual kind of, hey, how's it going? And we're also wired to say, I'm fine. I'm, do I'm great. Yeah, it's tough, but I'm, I'm putting my head down. And then the last reason it's not okay necessarily just to rely on this is, um, and this came out in one of the studies I was involved in where we found that many times when people, when uh, clinicians provide uh, informal peer support for each other, they essentially try to minimize their colleagues' pain. Like, oh no, but you know, you're doing a great job or, oh, seriously, you know, you shouldn't worry about that, you know, um, which comes from a good place, but it's not received well. It's not comforting to have your emotions minimized. So formal peer support where you're trained as a non-behavioral uh, health person to, to provide a in-depth uh, meaning like really a, an in-depth conversation for, uh, with your colleague, um, it uh, requires training, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a way of a, st a step up uh, from the deficiencies I just mentioned from informal peer support. Um, and so, um, and that also will not be enough for some people. And um, the beauty of, of uh, peer supporter is we can connect, uh, make it very easy, non-stigmatized way of if the of offering further resources uh, by professionals um, and other people who can help if the person needs ongoing help. So we're still providing emotional, psychological first aid. It's not, you're not setting up for a longitudinal relationship because we that's really out of the scope of, of a peer supporter and would be too burdensome to build a program like that. Um, and so it, and yet we can get the person connected with further resources if they'd like it. So operationalizing this. So I've just um, did, done the first part, spent most of the time, which I think is, is the hardest part, is really making the case as to why we need the peer support program and why, why it should look like what I'm going to tell you. Um, so the recipients, you decide who are you gonna offer this for? And, and you could, it could be for everyone in the whole organization. It could be for just people on health, you know, clinical healthcare teams. It could be uh, all uh, physicians, residents, and uh, advanced practice providers, or just physicians. Um, there's pros and cons of different ones, but what I I think the most important thing I can say about this is, um, it you know it well it's connected to whatever the resources are. So some some of the programs that I've helped develop have come the resourcing has come from, for example, a physician well-being group, and that their mandate is to direct it towards physicians. Others say, hey, this is for the entire organization. That's great. You can do it, and I think the. What, but I, I think it's really important to remember that there are certain groups who have not, whose needs have not been addressed by the standard mental health. We've got support because of the barriers that I'll talk more about. So I think physicians need it, you know, um, in a certain kind of way because of our cultural and structural um, barriers. 
So um, you decide who the recipients will be and then what for what will you provide peer support? Um, and once you decide that, you need to make sure that the people who would know about the circumstances and events for which you wanna provide peer support will tell the, the director of the peer support program so someone can be assigned to, uh, to be that supporter. So what are the barriers to seeking support? You know, and, and that's, this is really an important part of the study that we, that we did, um, it, it, it showed when we said, you know, what would keep you from, uh, or what would your barriers be to, to getting support? Lack of time, stigma, lack of confidentiality, and access. Like, I don't even know how to do this. Um, and this was, again, specifically for physicians. And this is my way of putting it together. You know, we've been taught and have internalized the idea that we're strong, and strong means denying our own needs, including emotional needs. There's a culture of silence. People don't tend to say, to, to admit their vulnerabilities. Um, uh, and then as I talked about before, our physical, mental, and emotional needs are, are, we deem them unimportant because they pale in comparison to our patients, families, communities, and even colleagues. So we're, we're sort of comparing like, well, I'm not as bad off as far as like my circumstances. So what right have I to focus on myself? And then it brings us to the last point um, that I think is really important that we really do have internalized the self-care is selfish and so is self-compassion. Um, when of course we know, you know, we all know the oxygen metaphor of uh, you, you got to put your own on first if you're going to be any use to anybody else. And even if it wasn't because you weren't going to be any, of any use to anyone else, we're, we're humans too, right? Yes, we're healers, but we need healing too. So um, based on that, um, peer support, I believe, should be reach out um, and proactive. So the reach out part is um, based on it's unfair to put the burden on individual clinicians to go and find help. Um, we all have programs where they can do that. And as I said, it, it can tend to underserve specific groups and specific individuals. So you need a program where the, the um, offer for, peer, for support is, is made easy and destigmatized. And part of peer support, you know, training peer supporters is to teach them how to do the reach out. And it would be something like, you know, hi, um, you know, making sure you did this by phone. Um, I, I'm, I, you know, I reached out as a peer supporter. I'm reaching out because um, I don't know if you know this, but we have a peer support program and we reach out to we're reaching out routinely now, specifically around whatever the issue is, whether it's an acute event or COVID or what have you. Um, and the reason we do this is because I and all my colleagues are dealing with similar issues. And some of us find it really helped to talk to a colleague. Is that something you'd like to do? That's very different from sending a memo out saying, hey, we have a program here, you know, call us if you need it. You should have that too, right? All, any of these programs, very easy to set up as a reach in program. Sure, make it easy for people, but don't wait for people to, to find you. And then don't wait for the clinicians to manifest stress. Like why should we, when we know that there are circumstances that are highly stressful, you know? So you could argue, um, for example, as one organization I work with, they said, we want to focus our peer support, we're, you know, you're going to help us develop this on the residents who are treating COVID frontline, and this was back in April, right, because the, it is so stressful for them. So we're going to target them to start with. Um, uh, we are going to, uh, another example is organization saying it, we'll just reach out to anybody involved in a significant, you know, adverse event. Uh, we'll reach out to anybody where there's been, you know, uh, patient aggression. I'll, I'll show you a list of some possible triggers, but reach out proactively um, and then integrate the idea of people feeling might, might be emotional or might have emotions, I should say, um, into rounds, into team meetings, say, hey, this was a tough week or a tough day. Just want to, you know, acknowledge that um, um, and also say, you know, some sometimes it's you know, hurts. And, and if it does, you know, we, we 
you know, we have support and we can get you support and I'm going for support or whatever it is, just integrated into our, our current clinical processes or our current processes. So just a um, one list of, you know, possible uh, uh, to reach out, litigation. Um, this is a, a website actually that um, I'm on the board for just making sure it stays, it's not a financial uh, uh, issue. I mean, uh, investment or anything, but, you know, anybody who's involved in litigation should get resources, um, I believe, including a, a, a peer support reach out um, and then access to, which this is for anybody, to, to, to help. Um, adverse events, even without an error. Uh, communication with patients, you know, help with disclosure and apology. Chronic stress, like COVID. Uh, emotionally stressful patient death, even when the care was just lovely, perfect. Um, end of life care, uh, being complained about uh, to the medical board or, or another organization by patients. Um, patient aggression, um, you know, again, lots of potential uh, triggers could, could be used. So then you need to make connections with anybody who would know about such events, circumstances, triggers, et cetera. Clinical leaders and managers, unofficial leaders, peers, who would be able to say, hey, this happened, um, here are the people involved, risk management, patient safety, et cetera. Further resources, you wanna have that list available with the numbers like for further support, you know, all these things. And so all the peer supporters have this list and, and make sure they give it to, um, you make it quite available and specifically send it to anybody they provided peer support to. And then um, training. So um, you, the rationale um, for training is those of us who are not behavioral uh, health trained, um, not <laughs> as a surgeon, um, we need to learn how to be present for somebody without fixing the problem. You know, it's different. It's not like fixing a patient's Zinker's diverticulum, which is what I, um, that was my focus of my uh, surgical career. Um, it is very different. It is helping a colleague, but not fixing their emotions. Like, you, you know, tell, you know, helping them just stop feeling. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, and how to reach out in a way that destigmatizes the reach out or the acceptance, uh, um, um, how to um, listen um, and all also uh, use non-judgmental curiosity to sort of peel back the onion so people can sh um, express if they like their vulnerability. So um, I think, you know, not, we need training, right? Um, and, um, and then the question is who should be peer supporters? How do you get them? And this comes from experience in program building and sustaining um, and, and just asking for volunteer. I think asking for volunteers is not the right way to go because sometimes people who think they would be good at this are not actually the right people. So the best I think is a peer nominated, which also gets um, an awareness of the program that you're gonna be developing. Plus you get names of people and then you vet those through people who would know the, the and you want, and then it enables you also to get a diversity of peer supporters, um, both gender, um, ethnicity, um, uh, uh, seniority, specialty, discipline. You want a nice, um, uh, I would say diverse group to train. And then you want to make, you know, uh, as you know, do PR, uh, which is, you know, just going to put it out there um, at, at all sorts of venues. We have this program because I think awareness is good. Again, you don't, you can still, and of course, when programs start, you're all the refer all the reach outs that you're doing are kind of cold calls, if you will. And that's why you have to do it very, you know, um, uh, sensitively about how you, how you offer the support so people don't feel stigmatized by being reached out to. You absolutely make it as it's routine. This is what we do now. We're not pointing it at you. We just, we reach out um, as I think we should have done many years ago, but we are now. Um, and so you, but making people aware of the program. So also that they can reach in if they want to. Um, and then you want to track it and that's not hard to do. So leaders, coming back to the back to the first uh, conversation of making the case, what do leaders need? They need to resource the program. This is not an expensive program. Uh, the the peer supporters are not paid. Lots of reasons for that. Mostly because um, you, you're going to set it up so that you don't put them, uh, you don't burden them. Uh, uh, 
um, with saying, you've got to do this every week. In other words, you'd, uh, you'd make it so you train enough people, plus you uh, are, are clear about what the triggers are so that you ask somebody maybe five or six times a year for, you know, for, for an hour of their time, you know, each time to, to make a reach out uh, for peer support. And also if they can't do it, you tell them that time, that's fine, no problem, we'll find somebody else. Um, so, and also the behavioral um, economics work shows us that if you, if you monetize um, a, an interaction like peer support would be a, 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 that somebody would have wanted to do out of the goodness of their heart, um, you actually ruin it for them. And so, you know, it just, it, I, I don't think peer support, it, I mean, if you wanted somebody to be a mentor that is going to, or a, a, a coach, I should say, um, and, and you know, sign on for months of coaching up here, that's a different story that should be paid. Um, but anyway, the resourcing is basically just resourcing the director um, and also just, um, and the training and you know, program development and it's not expensive. Um, what's expensive is not doing something like this. It doesn't have to be this, but is not paying attention to the well-being, emotional well-being of our healthcare providers. That's expensive. Um, uh, you, you need to, leaders need to listen to and respond to thematic concerns. Remember this idea that like, you know, we can help individuals through it, but if there are things happening in the organization that shouldn't, that are adding stress that shouldn't be. For example, let's just say um, that, um, uh, there was something going on with your uh, vent analysis where it was being done routinely in kind of a, you know, shame and blame way. Well, that's an organizational problem. I mean, we can help our peer get through that, but it shouldn't be that way. So the, or the leaders would need to respond to that and work on, well, what's going on? Why are we not uh, using a safety culture? That's just, you know, an example. And you want to try to assess outcomes. I want to be clear here that um, it's very hard um, to, uh, to, to take some of the outcomes that we would want to see from a specific single program like peer support and say that they and study it, you know, did we prevent suicide? Did we uh, prevent burnout? Did we improve well being and job satisfaction? Um, and there's a lot of reasons, uh, having worked with some. Um, um, you know, specific uh, healthcare researchers, that it's very hard to prove uh, th that kind of benefit for the kinds of outcomes that we're look that we really care about. That said, it doesn't mean that there aren't assessment tools and there are um, uh, around looking, you know, at program development and pro program improvement. Um, and also, um, I would say, and this is broader than peer support, is if we're going as leaders to say, um, we insist that well-being of our uh, healthcare providers matters, then the people who are in charge of leading those groups, whether chairs, chiefs, uh, you know, whatever they are, uh, those people, managers, you know, those people should be responsible for the outcomes. Are they helping? Are they are the programs they're using, are the ways that they're leading um, actually improving well-being or at least decreasing burnout? Those sorts of things, you know, in aggregate need to be looked at. And then people need to be held accountable um, and we need to hold ourselves accountable for, well, maybe I'm not being the kind of leader that, um, you know, that, that is, is really supporting this. So um, that's where, as again, back to organizational systems and resources. So I think this, uh, I'm just about to close here, that peer support, I think, is a culture change tool. It gets us hopefully away from shame and blame, specifically around uh, adverse events, but also this idea just generally, whether regardless of what we're peer supporting for, that, that we're supposed to deny our emotions and realize that, realize that well, we're, we, we're hurting because we care, not because we're weak losers. We hurt because we care. Um, and yes, we're not the first in line. And, you know, acutely, we're there to manage patients, right? Um, and that's never going to change and it shouldn't change. But forever that we should not deal with our own emotions, that, that's not sustainable. Um, and then getting away from this isolation, this feeling like, uh, you know, people can't be, you know, ever process uh, uh, what's happening or that they're suffering and they think no one else is. Um, and, and as I come back to many times, just walking the talk saying that, you know, self, self care is not selfish. It's key and we deserve it because we are, you know, we need to be compassionate with ourselves. 
So I end with, um, you might've noticed I don't use the term second victim. Here's one reason, this is Parker Palmer, just to, it's, not about, uh, it's not about errors, but he, he's, uh, he talks about um, just the world that we create, that we're its co-creators, he says, we, which he feels is a source of awesome responsibility and profound hope for change. So victimhood just is not a great stance, but the real reason I don't use the term second victim, and I feel very strongly about this, is the, the patient advocates I work with do not like our referring to ourselves as victims after we've harmed them. They just don't like it. So for me, it was, and I love the term, or, or, you know, I think it had such a place um, in the history of recognizing emotional fallout after errors. Um, and I think I'm grateful that it, uh, that it was there. And I think we should, I just don't use it anymore. There's been no confusion about what I'm talking about. So I did want to mention that. Mainly, I want to stop um, and leave time for, um, well, just to thank you also for your commitment and engagement. I, as again, I've seen some of the amazing uh, things that you do and are doing, and I love that. Um, and actually, I, I know there are people um, I've worked with who are, uh, I think, probably uh, um, uh, what we're signed up to be at, um, at this webinar. And I just wanna, um, I, I wanna shout out you personally, but just your organizations uh, um, who I know are doing the work and many of you are, um, and you know, thank you for that. So I welcome um, certainly questions and also, or just reactions, right? It doesn't have to be a question. It can be like a reaction, a feeling, um, a concern, uh, affirmation, none of the above or a question. So, Thank you, just a pleasure to uh, be part of this with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. We will jump into those um, comments, affirmations, and questions after these next few slides. For additional resources to support your physicians and staff during this time, please visit the American Medical Association website. We thank you again for your time today and hope that you're able to join our next scheduled webinar, which is this Thursday, November 12th at 12 p.m. Central Time, which will feature AMA's Carol Vargo, who will present on keeping your practice open during COVID-19. For general questions or comments, please email action.labs at ama-assn.org. Finally, after concluding this webinar, you will have the opportunity to participate in a brief four question survey. We ask participants to please take two minutes to fill out the anonymous survey. Your feedback is really important to us as we continue to develop future programming. Now, Dr. Shapiro, after we close out the presentation, we will jump into the Q&A. Um, to our participants, again, please place your, Q your questions in the Q&A box, um, or we're, we are actually encouraging you to use the raise your hand function and we will unmute you so that you can um, elaborate on any follow-up questions, articulate any comments verbally. Um, please feel free to do so that way. So Dr. Shapiro, we're going to, if you could end the presentation screen, we can get our camera set up here. There we go. Can you see me okay? I can. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So I did see that we, we we have several questions in the queue. I did see a couple of hands. I saw some hands raised that I no longer see raised. So if you do have questions or comments that you would like to articulate verbally, go ahead and raise your hands again and we will unmute you. Um, until then, we can go ahead and get jump into the questions in the Q&A. The first question that we have, Dr. Shapiro, is what is the best way for peer supporters to respond if a colleague comes to them to discuss concerns about sexual harassment or bullying, particularly if the colleague feels the individual harassing or bullying them as someone higher up in the chain of command? Yeah. Um, well, that's a, that is a very challenging and important question. Um, so um, I, just to uh, be clear about my background, so for over 10 years at the Brigham, uh, before I left a year ago, um, I had created and ran the Center for Professionalism and Peer Support. And the professionalism portion was um, uh, designed to deal with concerns about either repetitive or egregious behavior uh, that 
that would you know would violate trust, which would be obviously harassment, bullying, any of those things. Um, and so we had a whole program, and I've published uh, on this um, for a safe way to bring forward concerns. Um, so it, um, generally speaking, the peer support was not for that, if you will. That so there was a, a sort of a separate way to get to get help for that. Um, so, so I just want to make that difference clear. But let's say you have this peer support program and somebody does reach in and says, I'd like some support for this. I think I would, I would use the exact same principles that I teach when I do training for peer support, which is, um, let, you know, let the person tell their story um, and then, you know, then say, um, explore with them what they, you know, what they've already tried, um, you know, uh, uh, who they've already spoken to, um, and 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 really help uh, this idea of, you know, problem solving guidance is to think of is there somebody above that person because that person apparently in this example is their direct supervisor, um, is there someone uh, above them or sort of lateral to them that that they could go to organizationally um, and say I just, you know, here's my concern and I'm worried about retaliation. Um, I mean, I've, I could, you know, give a whole talk on, and I have on how to set up an organizational program that is, um, that actually lets people report concerns that's fair to them, uh, retaliation wise, and also um, protects the people about whom concerns are reported, meaning they get, you know, fair shot at, um, you know, it gets assessed in a way that to see if the concerns are valid. So, you know, it's a great question, but just like anything else with peer support, if people, you know, if you're sitting down, you're really listening, sometimes actually that's helpful, just that and exploring with them and then helping them think is, you know, what could they do organizationally? That's really helpful. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. So the next question is, with peer recommendations, it seems as if nominated individuals would be those that often give energy in the form of listening and taking on the weight of others' issues. Are there any concerns about the peer support individual becoming burned out by taking on this additional weight? Um, yeah, I'm always concerned about that. It's a good question. I think you have to set it up that you don't burn out yourself. I mean, that would be the worst thing, you know, that we create more burnout, uh, for, especially from this, you know, this, this group of people that's already giving a lot. Um, it really, so I think there's some ways to do that. One is by um, limiting the, you know, not limiting the ask, right? You're not, you, um, and then also perhaps for them, um, if they're getting asked a lot, outside of the official program to do this is for them to be able to share that burden, if you will, saying, you know, to a colleague, hey, you know, I, I'd love, you know, there's a whole group of, I can, I can get you a specific person to, to, to reach out to or further resources. So you, it, it, you could help them contain, if you will, their responsibility. Um, and then I think, so yes. And then the other question is what, what do you, you know, what, what do you give how do you give back to the peer supporters? Um, well, for one thing, they have to have uh, a way to make sure any concerns they have are just, you know, they can go right up to the director of the program, of course. And the other is if, to make sure that, and this comes out in training, we do talk about this, is that if they can't do an individual one or they feel like they're getting burned out, that they stop doing this and that they get support, support themselves. And the other is, and this has become easier in many ways with Zoom or the equivalent uh, platform, is keeping them together, the peer supporters as a community, uh, meaning, you know, say monthly or every couple months where they, you have a Zoom meeting and they can talk about uh, what, how they're doing, right? I mean, because I do a lot of group uh, peer support, uh, which is very translatable from being trained to do one-on-one -on -one, is to be able to, to have a conversation with peers um, just about how things are going and um, whether it's peers about peer support or not, and then getting them a chance to, you know, ask questions or what have you and to share. Um, what's hard about the virtual platforms is we used to do this, you know, in person and we fed people, right? We can't do that anymore. So I haven't figured out what to do about that. But um, yeah, just making sure you're supporting them and being very, very careful that the, the demands are very, are, are minimal in that sense. And the last thing I'll say is it's really rewarding to do this kind of peer support. In fact, you know, I, I'm, maybe I'm flattering myself to say like, I was a person I think people would come to, but doing it, you know, this, this, special way, if you will, um, 
is so rewarding and it really does help you with the more casual questions and concerns, you know, when uh, it, it, meaning like someone just kind of relying on you, it, it really gives you some tools to be able to be present without losing yourself and feeling burdened yourself. It's pretty replenishing, interestingly. Thank you. So this next question also relates to peer supporters. So I'll go on to this one. Um, what ratio of peer supporters to uh, potential recipients do you recommend an organization aim to recruit? A very good question. This is a question, believe it or not, it's that I just have the hardest time answering because, you know, I, there's no, you know, RCT on this. And it. so let me just tell you how I answer when I'm working with programs. Um, I don't know is the first answer, but um, so it depends on what your triggers are gonna be. So if the trigger is going to be like acute crises, um, they're not gonna happen that often. And you, what you wanna do is you wanna have enough people where um, I, I would say like in a big organization, and also again, it, how many people are you providing the peer support for? Right. So if it's a, so I have places where they just want to do it for their department. Obviously, you don't need a ton of people. Right. Um, others where they want to do it for thousands of people. Um, and so th there's that. I, I get I, I think the best answer is, you know, for any sizable organization, you want to start out training about 30 people, 25 people, something like that. You can always expand. Right, you can always do another training um, and get more people. Um, but what happened is, if you train tons, then people just don't have the experience of doing it, um, and that I think they need to and they want to. That's why they signed up to say yes to do it. Um, and so I, I guess that's what I would say is like, you know, train twenty five, you get a nice diversity of people you can really do in that, you know, twenty, thirty, something like that. Unless it's a really small organization, in which case that would be too many. Um, Although it doesn't hurt to train people who aren't going to actually do it, still they'll 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 benefit in some ways, even offering support at home, um, and so yeah, that would be a, an approximate answer, and then seeing what the needs are going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm noting the time, so we we probably have enough time for two more questions. Um, this next question asks how a peer supporter should respond if a colleague asks them to accompany them when they're meeting with HR or a, a leader in order to support them. Yeah, I'd say that's out, outside of the scope. It, you know, it's a boundary issue. Um, we're not, we're not, we don't, you know, that, and that would require more than, you know, that hour of commitment to that person. We're talking really just, this is a one-off with, you know, maybe two, you might meet for two sessions, but that's, that's beyond the scope. And you, you know, that's, it just is. So right. yeah, I'd say okay. no. Good yeah. to know. Um, I mean, help, so help them find someone who could do that, but that would not be, right. be outside of the role. Right. So in your experience with peer support, have you ever found that physicians are hesitant to be transparent um, or express their emotions? And how do you encourage openness and honesty? Um, I, yeah, I, I'll tell you, I am amazed, um, you know, maybe especially being a surgeon about if it's set up right where you've got psychological safety, I am amazed at how honest, forthcoming and willing to share vulnerabilities I've seen physicians be. It's amazing, um, and it's beautiful. It really is. Uh, but what and what it makes me reflect on is just how rarely people have the chance to do that, and how welcome it is. Um, that said, you know, again with the training, it, it, this idea of 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 essentially. If, so let's say I'm doing peer support intervention of, you know, if somebody starts to tell me what's going on and I ask like, well, I wonder how is this, you know, you said this is bothering you, tell me more in what way. Um, and then I start to say things, you know, if they say, well, I'm worried about X, Y, or Z, I could say something like, I remember I felt, I have felt that way. I was in, you know, not the exact situation, but similar, or that is such a common concern. It's completely normal to feel that way. So doing the peer support is what you're doing is you're normalizing the emotions. And so when people start to say something and you, you know, you're, you're kind of there with them, like, oh gosh, yes. And that's, I think why people on that survey are like, I want to talk to a colleague because they know we get it. They know we don't think they're freaks. <laughs> you know, we, this is, you know, and, and that's the, one of the, that validation normalization happens during the course of peer support. Getting people to say yes to peer support, I think is really related um, primarily to how it's offered. 
And I tried to show you a little bit, but just by saying, hey, we're calling because, you know, we, this is what we do. I've been there, um, you know, and I, it's, I remember it being hard or I know it's hard or, you know, and, you know, would, is, would you like to, you know, talk about it? Um, so, yeah, you, I think that said, you never want to force anyone to talk about anything. That, that's kind of a known thing. And if they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. That's fine, too. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. So for the sake of time, we're going to hold off on the remaining questions in the Q&A. Dr. Shapiro, if it's okay, I think we, we, we only have about a handful of questions left. If we can send those to you and then distribute sure. them after the event, that would be great. Um, Dr. Shapiro, thank you again for your time and your expertise today. To all of our participants, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you in one of our upcoming webinars um, soon. Uh, take care. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you so much.